It's time to talk about the very best comic books of the week. And we do not have uh, Drew from Comics Elite. They are at C2E2, so I've got a ringer. <laughs> I've got uh, Gabe from Comical Opinions as well as Weird Science DC. How you doing, Gabe? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for having me, Wes. And congratulations on 20K subscribers for your channel. You deserve it. Thank you very much. We've been working very hard. Nice to see all the hard work paying off. Yep. Very exciting times. Now, I've got to tell you, Gabe, I'm sure you know this as well as I do. Yep. This wasn't the greatest week in the history of comic books. We wanted to talk about good stuff, so we found stuff that maybe wouldn't be recommended on another week. It just wasn't that week. It was not a strong week at all. But, you know, we, we tried to find the diamond in the rough. Absolutely. So first up, I'm going to recommend Stillwater number 14 from Image Comics, Chip Zdarsky, Ramon Perez. We are in the final stretch of this story regarding Stillwater in a town of immortals. And there's a little kid, Galen, and he's kind of done a hostile takeover of the town. And now they're expanding into uh, Clearwater, I believe it's called, like the neighboring town. And he's taken that over. Pretty much gone insane here, Gabe. And it is paced for the trades. It, it is uh, yeah. not the fastest brewing story in the history of the world. But I do think there's still quality there. It's kind of interesting. Tuck Everlasting you know, kind of meets... Uh, you know, children, what is it? Uh, children, children of the, the court, court or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I started reading this series on the first few issues and it's, it's definitely a slow burn. It's definitely one of those ish, uh, series where it, the, the, the concept isn't particularly original. You go to this town and everybody doesn't, nobody ages. And if you try and shoot them or kill them or whatever, they just, they heal and they come back. But the problem is nobody ever ages. So even little kids, they just get older in their mind and in their psyche and then their emotions, but their body never uh, gets, uh, never matures, never gets older. So uh, I haven't read it in a while, but I was able to dip back in and pick it up a little bit. The number issue number 14, which is where Galen, who's the mayor of Stillwater, even though he's in a 10 year old body, he's effectively 46 years old. Uh, He's gone loopy, loop de loop crazy bananas. Uh, and he's taking over the adjoining town because they feel like they need fresh blood. They need new faces. They need new territory. And you can tell basically everybody's going in pretty much insane. Uh, immortality has its downside. Um, Galen is the villain you love to hate. He's a little pisser. You want to slap him across the face. You want to put him in the ground. You just want to beat him up because you just can't stand the little pisser. And uh, this is one of those issues where the character work is re really where it shines. The art's okay. Uh, the story, again, if you if you have a little bit of background at the beginning, you know where this is going. You could pick it up pretty easily. But, yeah, man, Galen is the kid you love to hate. And and if you like that kind of character work and you want to see him get his comeuppance, even though it doesn't happen in this issue, it's coming up soon, uh, this might be a good pick for you. It is difficult to make a kid someone that you want to see lose, maybe not make it to the end. So kudos to Chip Zdarsky with this Galen character. Yep. Now let's go over to your big recommendation. I haven't heard of this Blood Moon Comics. Yep. Cover the Dead with line number one, Jonathan Chance and Hernan Gonzalez. I can tell kind of by the by the name of the comic book, I'm imagining this is in like the plague or something of that nature. What's going on here? Cover the Dead with Lime is it, Blood Moon is a small publisher, but they're they're starting to make a name for themselves by turning out some very effective, uh, very uh, impactful type stories. Cover the Dead with Lime takes place in the 1600s in England, and what's going on is uh, the plague effectively the Black Plague has come to the town by way of a ship that pulls up to the wharf. All these rats start coming out. The rats bite people. And it's very much in line with what, what the historical events of the Black Plague are um, uh, as far as how it, expect, uh, how it affected Europe. But in this case, what happens is when people get bitten and, and infected, they don't just get sick and die. They turn into zombies. And so the story follows this medical doctor who's got the plague mask, which is that big, long beak thing. Uh, as he goes around the town in the surrounding areas called up by the officials to try and lend medical aid but at the same time they recognize that the z zombie plague is upon them and he's forced in some cases to put people down it's a very sort of uh, tragic story in, in the sense of many of the uh, zombie films that you've come to know and love over the course of decades but in this case because the setting is so different and so unique and it's placed within the historical context it makes it a little bit of a fresh take that, uh, that some people might enjoy I personally like a little bit of historical fiction, especially when you throw like a little twist in here. That yep. sounds actually like it's a pretty darn good premise. Yep. But you were also recommending some superhero stuff on the indie scene. Project Superpowers, Fractured States, number five from Dynamite Comics. Ron Mars with co-writer Andy Lanning with Emilio Utrera on the art. Project yep. Superpowers is kind of cool. They go back and they take uh, heroes kind of out of public domain, bringing them in to make this kind of superhero team.
Right. So Project Superpowers is Dynamite's um, uh, project, if you want to call it that, uh, mostly known for the Alex Ross art because he helped kind of co-create the, the, the line from the very beginning where they take a bunch of public domain characters, they bring them into a modern context, and they try and they start spinning out these superhero stories. Uh, Project Superpowers Fractured States actually takes place in a near future where one of the superheroes just sort of gets knocked out, wakes up in a coma, he doesn't know who he is, and then a few decades later, uh, America is just split into these little fiefdoms uh, lorded over by these different sort of warlords or some cases master criminals, some cases superheroes that have gone insane, and he's trying to figure out who he is. So this is the finale issue of this five-issue arc. Uh, and the uh, the writing's been fairly solid. The art is very good. And then what we find out in this issue, which is the finale, is the secret identity of John Doe. And it's not what you expect. He's not a superhero that just kind of didn't remember who he is. It turns out that he's a, something completely different, and it, and it really sets up the idea of uh, spinning out into different stories using this cast of characters from Project Superpowers. So if you're looking for a superhero fix, but it's not Marvel or DC, and, and that uses characters that have been, in some cases, around for quite a long time, uh, this is going to be a good fit for you as well. Yeah, Dynamite does a lot of kind of cool stuff, and Project Superpowers is definitely one of those. Now let's go over to the big two. We do have Marvel Comics. We've got a couple of recommendations here. I'm recommending Demon Wars, The Iron Samurai, number one, written and illustrated by Peach Momoko. Kind of rolling out of this Demon Day series that Peach Momoko has been doing at Marvel Comics. I personally have really enjoyed these, kind of incorporating Marvel Comics stories and characters into Japanese-style fables. This is loosely based on Marvel Comics' like Civil War event, but it's very loose. Like it, it's, You can see it's inspired by it, but it's not completely beholden to what they did in Civil War. It's her interpretation within Japanese fables for doing that. Obviously, the Iron Samurai is Iron Man. We also get to see Carnage in here, uh, Black Panther. We, that's kind of the coolest thing about these. I, I really do enjoy the stories. I think they're very good, but it's those weird little Easter eggs when you're trying to figure out which Marvel character is that? You know, is that one based on a Marvel character? And that's kind of one of the more fun things I have about this series. Yeah, what's interesting about this series is it has, uh, this is Peach Momoko, so it has a very uh, kind of Japanese-inspired manga style to it, but it's not quite that. Uh, it's, it's definitely analogs to the existing Marvel heroes, and this is supposed to be loosely based on Civil War. But what's nice about it is it's not Civil War with a different coat of paint. It's far enough away that it feels like a completely different story. So if you've never... If you if somebody hadn't told you that it was related to Civil War, you could almost not see the connection. So it's, it definitely feels original, and it's nice. And, and the, that that whole positive about being able to kind of find the Easter eggs and who is who and who is supposed to represent what what character um, for each of the different players in the story. You can definitely tell who is Black Panther. You can definitely tell who is Carnage. And you can definitely do, tell who is Iron Man. But some of the other ones, you're not quite sure. And like, okay, maybe these are amalgams of two or more characters put together. And so the, you have the little bit of the fun of picking out the Easter eggs. It definitely feels like an original story. If you like the Japanese-influenced manga art style, this is going to appeal to And it's colorized. It's not black and white. Uh, yeah, this is definitely an interesting read. It's 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 outside of the main Marvel continuity, so it's something that you can read that's Marvel. It's something that has that Marvel flavor, but it, it's a it's a unique thing that definitely stands on its own. And the cool thing is, it's been mostly one shots after the original Demon Day series, but this is a four part series, so you got a little bit more story to chew on on this one. So I'm really excited about that. Yep. Pichu Moko, it turns out, is a very good interior artist as well as being a cover artist. We're also going to recommend Moon Knight number 14, Jed McKay as Alessandro Capuccio. I still think Alessandro Capuccio maybe is, is carrying this a little bit at this point. The, the art is definitely the best part of this comic book, this issue. We've wrapped up the first story arc, and we haven't done a lot of introspection about Moon Knight and his multiple personalities, and we definitely get kind of an adventure inside of his mind kind of thing going on here. So it mm -hmm. does feel a little bit different, although I kind of want to – deal with Harvest Moon and some of that other stuff that had already been incorporated into the story. Yeah, agreed. This issue... Uh I want to. I don't want to call. It, I don't want to call it a breather issue because that would be unfair. It definitely feels like some things are happening. I say the word definitely a lot. I need to cut that back. Uh, 
you have a conversation between Mark Spector, Stephen Grant, and Jake Lockley, and they're trying to reassess their working relationship, if you want to put it that way. So from that regard, and they do come to a sort of conclusion at the end, from that regard, it feels like the status quo is being shaken up a little bit. That's always a positive. I like to see character development, especially established characters, uh, evolve a little bit and trying to move into a new status quo. That feels like it's happening here. As far as the main plot with Moon Knight going against uh, Tudor and and his vampire organization there's almost no plot development in this there's a there's a fight that's happening with uh, Nimium and uh, Grand Maul in the physical world while that conversation is happening. So as far as the overall plot of the arc as it started, not a whole lot happens here but it feels like the character is evolving a little bit. So if you're okay with just sort of taking a breather, but feeling also like something is, is starting to move in a certain direction. Uh, you might enjoy this one a bit. And the, and the art is great. Capuccio's art is fantastic. In this issue. Yeah, he's absolutely been a revelation when it comes to this yep. Moon Knight series. I had no idea, but he is absolutely someone to keep an eye on. Let's go over to DC Comics. Batman 126, Chip Zdarsky, Jorge Jimenez. I kind of talked about this one in depth with Josh earlier. I really like this issue. They really needed to establish... Um, Fail safe in the the threat that he represents, not only to Batman, but to the Bat Payment family. Certainly gives you a couple of hints of what fail safe is all about. He wants to kill Bruce Wayne. Not so much Stephanie Brown and the other Batman family kind of characters. It's really interesting. Jorge Menez's art isn't quite as crisp as the first issue, but I'm certain that that was by design. It's supposed to feel like you're in a tornado because it, the, the stakes are kind of dialed up with fail safe just blasting everybody left and right for what it is i really like this i don't know about the reveal at the end but we'll see where that goes are, are we spoiling the reveal or are we holding that off well we've already spoiled it heroes work best when you have a villain that is more powerful than the hero it has to be something the hero has to overcome this is an indomitable hero so you have this fail safe android that basically knocks the bat family flat they have no chance he, Batman is on his heels right from jump, and he never gets a chance to recover until the very end. So that is a that is a fantastic villain for a street level grounded uh, collection of heroes like Signal, uh, Stephanie Brown, Nightwing, and everybody else. They just get their their butts handed to them uh, in total, and so that's the, that's a perfect kind of villain for this kind of group of heroes. Now the reveal at the end, which turns out to be that. The reason Batman acts like he doesn't know what Failsafe is, even though Failsafe came from the Batcave, is it was created by a different part of his psyche, which is uh, I always get Zurin R, which is the Zurin, which comes from the Morrison Run. So if you love the Morrison Run, you got something that you're gonna like here. If you didn't like the Morrison Run, you're probably gonna roll, roll your eyes and turn your head and cough and, and think you need to move on until Starcy picks up something else. So that was definitely a twist. I don't think anybody saw coming. You may or may not like it, but uh, the rest of the issue issue is fantastic. You want to see Batman challenged in a way where he doesn't have time to plan, where he doesn't have time to strategize, and Failsafe does exactly that. So this is a perfect villain for this type of hero. Yeah, I thought it was a, it was a lot of fun. The stakes feel like they've been raised, so that was yeah. a good job on that one. We'll see about the, the end on it. The last one we're going to recommend is Flashpoint Beyond number four. Mm -hmm. Jeff Johns co-writing with uh, Jeremy Adams, Tim Sheridan, Zermonico on art. It's an interesting story. We get to see a bit more Bruce Wayne in this issue, which I did appreciate. But it, I'm really digging the um, the Oswald Cobblepot Thomas yep. Wayne stuff. That's like my favorite thing about the whole story, personally. We do get the big reveals about this new Robin and Two-Face and a big reveal concerning Joker. I didn't really like that one. I don't know what the point of Flashpoint Beyond is, but I do enjoy the story. I think calling it Flashpoint Beyond means that it needs to interweave or interlock somewhere into the DC Comics universe rather than just being an Elseworld story. But there's interesting stuff going on here, and I, I do like some of the, the flavor of the comic book. You can't argue with the execution of the comic. The the art is great. The writing execution is great. The pacing, the plotting, the dialogue, it's all great. You can't argue with that. The, the, where I'm getting stuck on it is I, I haven't quite figured out how to justify this comic's existence. You brought back Flashpoint after it was already gone. But why did you bring it back? It sort of hasn't. That's the big question right from the very beginning, even when it was announced. But they haven't quite answered that question. Now, if you're okay with not having that question answered and you just want to enjoy the ride, this is a great, this is a fantastic comic. One of the better ones that DC's put out this week. So if you're okay with the ride, but you don't, and you don't mind that figuring out the destination, then there's, then the, this is going to be a great comic, right? There's a reveal at the end that the, 
there's a the key or the crux of the character who's basically the, the identity of the clockwork killer is Flashpoint Joker, which is Martha Wayne who went insane. I, I don't know how to explain that because at the end of Flashpoint, she committed suicide. She's supposed to be dead. So how she comes back and how she's interconnected with Dark Crisis and Hyper Time and the Omniverse and all that stuff, you know, that's on Jeff Johns and everybody else to try and figure out. So I don't know how any of that makes sense. And that's kind of why I'm kind of getting stuck on it not sort of justifying its existence yet. But again, if you if you put the question, uh, the answer to the question aside and just enjoy the ride for what it is, you're really going to enjoy how this comic turns out. And, and right, the, the, the highlight for me of this series is the interaction between Cobblepot and Dexter Dent, the little boy, where he's just showing him how to do every horrible thing you can imagine uh, from shooting weapons to building bombs. And it's, it's a treat. You get a little bit less of that here, but that, that's definitely going to be the high point of the series so far for me. So that's going to do it as far as our big comic book recommendations. The indie scene just wasn't quite hot this week like it had been the previous few weeks. I would say DC Comics maybe had the best week. They had a lot of really high stuff up there. So I hope you enjoy the comic books. Do you have any final words there, Gabe? Uh, no, just go read more comics and please pray for DC Warner Brothers and Discovery. <laughs> They're having a rough week right now. If you need some more information on Batman 126, as I mentioned, Josh and I not only talked about that one in depth, but Dark Crisis number three. We were less enamored with Dark Crisis, but really enjoyed Batman 126. If you want some more information, definitely check this video out. This might be the comic book you were looking for.